Uh, let's just open up prayer real fast. Lord, thank you for the freedom to gather here this morning. Lord, I just ask you to be with me as I give this class, Lord. I'm not much of a speaker, but Moses wasn't either. Lord, please be with the teachers next door as they teach these precious children. And Lord, be with our pastor today as he shares your word with us. Lord, we love you. We honor you in everything we do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so in my first two classes on this whole series we've been doing, we, we looked at the King James, which is translated from the traditional Greek text manuscripts, and we compared it to the modern Bible versions, which are, which are translated from the critical Greek text manuscripts. Um, we, we saw that they're not the same. Modern versions, they don't just read different, but they attack basic doctrines of the Christian faith. They also omit words, and they leave out large chunks of scripture. Virtually all modern Bible versions are based principally upon two manuscripts, Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. So I made you all this state-of-the-art chart right here, using the most modern high-tech tools I had available to me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, if y'all look on the bottom of this page I gave you, let me get you one, brother. So I know this, this is a kind of a complicated subject if I'm just talking about it. So I made this so everybody can kind of see how all this ties together. So you got the critical Alexandrian text, and it's right here on the bottom. The critical text family is made up of, of about 45 Greek manuscripts. One of those manuscripts is Codex Vaticanus. Another manuscript is Codex Sinaiticus. And the 43 remaining manuscripts, those are just called the eclectic text. But um, in 1881, two dudes, and I'll, I'll talk about them in a later class, they were really, they weren't believers. But no, they put together a Greek New Testament in 1881 using these, uh, what I wrote down here on the bottom, and uh, later on, that Greek text, it, it was kind of worked upon by others, Nestle and Aland, and also the United Bible Societies. They printed a critical Greek New Edition, or New Testament edition. And, uh, but it's from those that virtually all modern Bible versions are translated from. But anyhow, I just wanted to make that for you all so you all can kind of see how that ties together. So anyhow, but because virtually all modern Bible versions, they're, they're basically translated from Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, a reasonable person has to admit that the credibility of modern Bible versions rests upon the integrity of those two manuscripts. Last class, we talked about Codex Sinaiticus and how all evidence points to it being a 19th century forgery. Now the story of Vaticanus, it's not as colorful as the story of Sinaiticus that I gave in last class, but there are, it, there are serious issues pertaining to the integrity and the antiquity of Vaticanus. So it's important to understand Vaticanus because virtually uh, all modern Bible versions, about 90% of their contents come from this one manuscript, Codex Vaticanus. So let's talk about the conventional history of Vaticanus, what, what they say. Proponents of the critical text, they believe that Vaticanus was produced in about the fourth century in Alexandria, Egypt. And it may have been one of 50 Bibles commissioned by Constantine the Great for the churches of Constantinople. 
Now, if that were true, like they say, it would open up a whole new can of worms. Constantine, who was an apostate, he commissioned Eusebius, who was a heretic, to produce a Bible based upon the manuscripts of another heretic named Origen. But I'm not get sidetracked on it right now. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later in this class. The first concrete historical record of Codex Vaticanus is in the year 1475, when it appeared in the catalog there at the Vatican Library. There's no specific historical record of it prior to that. And from then to now, its shelf number at the Vatican has been number 1209. When Erasmus, who put together um, what's known as the Textus Receptus, when he was working on his third edition of that in the year 1521, he corresponded with the head librarian there at the Vatican to see if Codex Vaticanus contained 1 John 5.7 which is also known as the Johannan comma, I think. You probably read about that. Um, but it did not. But the whole reason I'm telling you that is because that's the first record of anyone ever consulting that manuscript, Codex Vaticanus, for anything at all. There's no record of it being used for or consulted for anything prior to the year 1521. And here's a fun fact about Vaticanus. I don't know why I included it, but I think it's interesting. Is Napoleon, actually, he took a, the Codex Vaticanus to Paris in the year 1809 as like a spoil of war, and it was returned to uh, the Vatican about six years later. But anyhow, so last week, or last class, I talked a lot about Constantine Tischendorf, and he's hearing this story about Vaticanus as well. So the same Dr. Tischendorf that claimed to have discovered Codex Sinaiticus is also responsible for bringing Codex Vaticanus into the spotlight. In the mid-1800s, he became aware of what was purported to be an ancient manuscript of the New Testament just sitting in the Vatican Library. In 1843, Tischendorf, he was allowed by the Catholic authorities of the Vatican to see this manuscript for a total of six hours. 23 years later, in 1866, Tischendorf, Tischendorf was, he was allowed to not only view the manuscript again, but this time he is allowed to make some editorial notes on it. And after much negotiating with the Vatican authorities, he was allowed access to Vaticanus for a total of 14 days, three hours a day. The Vatican, they really guarded this manuscript. They were real careful about who they let come in, especially non-Catholics, allowing them to come in and, and view this, this manuscript. But anyhow, so that's, that's only a total of 42 hours of access time that Tischendorf had spent with this manuscript. But however, somehow he was able a year later to publish a, uh, his own edition of Vaticanus based upon those measly 42 hours he spent. And it must have been a pretty bad printing because uh, in the year 1881, the Roman Catholics, they come up with their own printed edition of Vaticanus. So let's, let's talk about some of the wonky things with Codex Vaticanus, just upon looking at it, some things that are wrong with it. Let's talk about drop caps. So at the beginning of every biblical book in Vaticanus, there's what's called drop caps. Um, a drop cap is, some of y'all's Bibles might have this, I know all 1611 King James have it, but the very first letter of every chapter is really big. I know in like my King James Bibles, it's real big and it's decorated with like flowers and stuff, some artwork around it, but that's all that a drop cap is. But uh, the, the, the drop caps found in Vaticanus, they're clearly painted in bright colors and there's colorful artwork at the beginning of each biblical book. And the reason that this is important it's called drop caps and such artwork. They're medieval in character. They're not fourth century in character. They're medieval. No other ancient documents from the fourth or fifth centuries contain colored artwork or drop caps. And this implies that Vaticanus was written or at least reworked sometime during the medieval period. Let's talk about minuscule lettering. Greek lettering dating back to the fourth century is called uncial lettering. And I covered that a little bit last class. Financial lettering is lettering that is all 
uppercase capital letters. There's no lowercase lettering. And uh, some people call this majuscule lettering. But uh, sometime around the 9th and 10th centuries is when a form of cursive lowercase lettering developed. And this is known as minuscule lettering. So a characteristic of a manuscript that is truly from the 4th century, it's all going to be an uncial uppercase lettering, whereas a, a manuscript written later in medieval times will have all minuscule lowercase lettering. So then obviously it's odd that, that portions of Vaticanus are written in minuscule lettering. If you look at the first half of Genesis in Codex Vaticanus, you'll see it's, it's in minuscule lettering in the later half, the latter half of Genesis, it continues in uncial lettering. Now some, they'll try to say that the first half of Genesis was lost over the centuries and that later scribes just recopied these chapters using minuscule lettering. But we have high definition. This is available to everybody if you just look it up. We have, we have high definition color photography and you can see the age and quality of the parchment that was written upon in Vaticanus, parchment just being the pages that it's written upon. Um, you, you'll see that the quality of the parchment in the first and second half of Genesis is virtually the same. It's a, a different scribe's apparent in both sections, but the leaves of parchment that were written upon are clearly from the same lot. They're clearly of the same age, come from the same place. The same is true for like the New Testament portion of Vaticanus. From about halfway in Hebrews all the way through the book of Revelation, it's all in minuscule lettering. And again, there's virtually no difference in the quality or the, the appearance of the parchment that it's written upon. Let's talk about missing books in Vaticanus. Another anomaly found in Vaticanus is that the pastoral epistles of First and Second Timothy Titus and Philemon, they're all missing. It appears that these epistles, they were never intended to even be included in Vaticanus because no room exists whatever for them to even fit in there. And who knows for what reason they left these out. Um, but, you know, these are pretty important epistles, epistles that the Apostle Paul had written. But uh, the whole point of me telling you this is because just to illustrate that Vaticanus, it, it isn't a reliable source of scripture. Let's talk about inserted pages. In several places in Vaticanus, it's clear that leaves have been inserted into the codex at some later date. It's evident in pages which are of a different size and of a different coloration. On these pages, on these pages there appears to be a different scribe as well. And this all points to those pages being of a more recent age and points to the greater evidence that Vaticanus does not have any integrity whatsoever. Let's talk about the pagination. Pagination is just simply the, the method of numbering the pages. Like any book you pick up, you'll have you know, the page number somewhere in the corner or on the bottom of the page. That's pagination. But Vaticanus, it has a system of pagination in the upper corner of each page, and there's 1,536 pages in Codex Vaticanus. In the book of Acts, the pagination has obviously been scribbled out and overwritten, and uh, a higher page number written above the original page number, and that's, that's mighty shady. And this continues throughout much of the New Testament after the book of Acts, and it just shows clear evidence that Vaticanus was tampered with or modified at a later date. Um, but yeah, Va Vaticanus, it has, little, it has little integrity as an ancient source of scripture, yet you can pick up any modern Bible version and just know about 90% of that Bible is going to be translated from Vaticanus. Let's talk about out of place writing. And everybody, you can go on Google and you can, you can look at this for yourself. Just like with Codex Sinaiticus, there are places in Vaticanus where the original text is being scribbled out or written over. And there's also many places, 
where there is writing in the margins on the sides of the pages or in the blank spaces in the middle of the page. Um, I don't know if all, any of y'all have ever had to write a paper in high school or for college. And typically, you, you make your first copy and you see it's just full of errors. And you go through with a pen and you mark out stuff and you write stuff on the sides. That's, that's what Codex Vaticanus looks like, and it just leaves you to wonder, as you're looking at this, you see the main body of the text, but you see all the scribbling on the sides or on the bottom or in the middle, and you're like, what, what, which part is this is the word of God? Right. Let's talk about the ending of Mark 16. Just like in Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus, it omits verses 9 through 20 in the last chapter of Mark which is a very important testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Amen. Christ. Despite thousands of manuscripts containing these verses, only a few manuscripts, and I mean literally a few, like three or four, Codex Sinaiticus and Vaticanus being among them, they leave out the ending of Mark 16. As a matter of fact, in Codex Vaticanus, there is a blank space where it should be and there's no blank spaces like that anywhere else in Codex Vaticanus. As soon as one book and chapter ends, another book and chapter immediately begins right there. And I, I tell you, that's damning evidence. And also, when someone says that Mark 16, 9 through 20 were not in the earliest manuscripts, like these critical text proponents, they, they like to say, um, and they say that they were added later. Well, I'll just point them to people who either quoted or referenced these verses before the earliest manuscripts, like Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, supposedly existed. Guys like Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, Hippolytus, uh, Vincinius, Ambrose, Jerome, they, they all quoted or referenced the, those last verses of Mark 16 in their own works. Vaticanus, it, it has serious problems and like a clear intent to deceive by whoever modified it. It's clearly not a good manuscript to be used for any Bible translation, yet it is literally a pillar of modern Bible translations. And upon examination of the evidence, even from a, a country bumpkin like myself, this, that pillar, it crumbles. But let, let's talk about the Alexandrian roots of Vaticanus. In the year 1860, John Bergen, who was a, one of the preeminent textual scholars of his day, he was permitted to view Codex Vaticanus at the Vatican for only an hour and a half, and he was only allowed by the Vatican to consult 16 different passages. More than 160 years ago, John Bergen proclaimed Vaticanus to be one of the most corrupt manuscripts of the New Testament to be in existence. Amen. It was his assessment that Vaticanus clearly exhibited, uh, exhibited, exhibited, quote, a fabricated text and was the result of arbitrary and reckless revising. That's his words. Amen. Now, I'm, not, I'm certainly not as qualified as John Bergen on this subject. I'm just a truck driver. I'm not a, I'm not a scholar. But uh, I believe upon close examination of Vaticanus, it, his assessment's true. There's every indication that Vaticanus was at the very least reworked in med medieval times, if not just completely produced in medieval times. But for the sake of this class, let's just pretend that we're going to agree with these critical text scholars who uh, push the authenticity of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. And let's just agree with them that, that both these codexes were produced in 4th century Alexandria, Egypt. So let's travel back in time and just probe into the religious climate of Alexandria in the early centuries after the death of Jesus Christ. Alexandria, it was a major center of academic elitism. It was one of the major centers of higher learning in the entire Roman Empire. The founding of the uni University of Alexandria was called the third great epic 
in human history and civilization, and her library was reputed to hold like 900,000 volumes, probably the biggest library anywhere of its day. Alexandria was, of course, founded by Alexander the Great in the year 331 BC when he visited Egypt. And it was always, even though it's a, it's a city in Egypt, it was always the center of Greek learning and Greek culture. Because of its Greek origins and, and ongoing Greek culture, Alexandria became a magnet for, for both Greek philosophy and Greek philosophers. It was in Alexandria that other pagan philosophy, philosophies arose. Plato was considered one of the prophets in Alexandria, and from his influence, it was here that the heresy of Gnosticism was developed. Because of the large Jewish community in Alexandria, obviously the gospel also came there. And we know that the heresy of Gnosticism had infiltrated the, uh, the church in Alexandria, at least in the late first century. But it was things like this that prompted the Apostle Paul to write in Colossians 2.8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Amen. So you, you imagine Apostle Paul, he was traveling all around the Mediterranean at that time. Uh, and uh, you, you can just imagine the kind of wonky, heretical, false, pagan religions he probably encountered in his travels. In the second century, the first Christian theological school was founded in Alexandria, and it was modeled after earlier Gnostic schools that were established for the study of religious philosophy. This institution was called the Catechical School of Alexandria, and its founder, Pantinus, was, who was a Gnostic, by the way, he was the founder of this Catechical School of Alexandria. And by the way, Catholics, they call him Saint Pantinus, so it would take a little jab at the Catholics right there. Um, in the early third century, Clement of Alexandria, he became the next head of the catechetical school, and Clement, he likewise, he was heavily influenced by Pantinus and complimented him in, uh, in a letter we have today where he called, where, Pan, where Clement called Pantinus the deepest Gnostic. So we can see the apostasy, the apostasy that was in Alexandria around this time and how its principal school of theology was also apostate. The catechetical school of Alexandria it also became an educational center for, for Greek philosophy and Greek science. Well, Clement's successor was a man named Origen, and Origen became the head of the catechetical school in the year 232 AD, and it was under his leadership that the school reached its absolute zenith, where it, where it hit its peak at. And uh, now although Origen is considered by many to be one of the greatest minds of the early church, he is most definitely one of the greatest corrupting influences on the early church, as well as copies of the Bible back then. He sought to gather fragments of truth from that were scattered throughout the pagan philosophies and religions out there and unite them somehow to Christian teaching. Have y'all ever met somebody who, who, who pulls a little bit from this religion over here and maybe get into some Native American mysticism over here and some Buddhism and they, they pull it all and form their own false belief? That's origin. That is origin. That's the kind of dude that origin was. But, uh, you know, I just want to say, I can find all my religion right here in this book, the King James Bible. Now, Origen, Origen he had some wonky doctrines. And uh, Origen, he believed in infant baptism. He denied the resurrection of the body. He, he was a universalist, believing that all, including demons, would eventually be saved one day. He believed that the scriptures were of little use to those who understood them as written. Thus, he advocated the allegorizing of scripture for the interpretation of the Bible. He's believed to be the first one to ever teach the false doctrine of purgatory. Uh, a century after his death, there were disputes about the deity, 
of Christ and origin's influence on Arius is considered to be the beginning of Arianism. I don't know if anybody's ever read about Arius, but um, it was Origen who first included the Apocrypha in the Bible. And uh, it was at the Catechical School of Alexandria that Arius later taught and developed his heresy of denying the deity of Christ. So this was the theological and philosophical climate of Alexandria at that time predating the supposed production of Codex Vaticanus. After, uh, after Origen's death, another notable leader, he arose in Alexandria by the name of Eusebius. Eusebius was a, was a loyal follower of Origen. During this time, uh, during the time of Eusebius, Constantine the Great, he became the, the emperor of the Roman Empire. And it's well documented that Constantine made a profession of faith and declared Christianity to be the official religion of the Roman Empire. However, there's little evidence that the man was ever truly born again. And he probably, he probably only did that just for political reasons. Kind of like Joe Biden claims to be a Christian. I don't know, y'all remember when he was talking about the Psalms sometime around Christmas and he was calling it the, the Psalms? The Psalms, because he's reading it off a teleprompter. The Psalms. So, you know, he's kind of like a Joe Biden. I ain't trying to get political, I'm just saying. But anyhow, um, so Constantine, he had to educate himself on Christianity, and uh, he had to learn the details of Christianity, and of course he come to learn that the the Bible was the holy book of the Christians. He also learned that there were two major um, competing forms of the Bible, even in that day. One was the modest text that was used by the more common people, and this text would eventually become the received text, and it's the text that our King James Bible was translated from. And uh, the other text was that of Eusebius and Origen, which was favored by the more philosophically oriented upper class Christians. And uh, this is the Alexandrian text type that eventually came to make the critical text. You know, Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus are, are examples of that particular text. In the year 331, Emperor Constantine, he ordered Eusebius to produce 50 manuscripts for the churches of Constantinople. And it's widely accepted by proponents of the critical text that Codex Vaticanus was one of these 50 Bibles. And also, we were talking about Tischendorf and Codex Sinaiticus last class. Tischendorf, he claimed the same thing about Sinaiticus. He, he claimed that it was one of these 50 Bibles ordered by Constantine. However, there's absolutely no evidence to, to uh, back that up. Anyhow, the point is that Vaticanus, it has its origins from a source already given to apostasy and, and pagan Greek philosophy, confirmed heresy, and upper-class elitism. That's the whole point I'm trying to make. And this just doesn't vibe with how God has typically worked through the ages. You know, would God use such a setting for the transmission and propagation of his words? Of course, God can do anything he wants, but... Does God work in concert with apostasy and apostates? What well, fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Amen. If Vaticanus, if it truly represents the New Testament text that is closest to the originals, why, why did God allow it to be hidden for centuries and centuries? God promised in Psalm 12, 7 to preserve his pure word from generation to generation. I'm of the belief that if we compromise these biblical principles, I'm of the belief that we compromise these biblical principles if we accept that God allowed his word to flow through Alexandria. We know from our previous class that, that Sinaiticus didn't show up on Annie's body's map until the year 1844 when Tischendorf claimed that he discovered it. And we know from this class that there's no official record of, of Vaticanus until the year 1475 
and it wasn't used for any kind of translational purposes until Tischendorf used it in the mid-1800s. It literally sat in the bowels of the Vatican for that whole time. So I'm going to conclude my expose on Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus. To me, it's pretty simple. Codex Sinaiticus, like we talked in the, my last class, it's just an outright worthless forgery. All evidence points to that. And Codex Vaticanus, what we're talking about today, is also fraudulent and about as horrible of a manuscript that could possibly be used for the transmission of God's word. I encourage y'all, hop on the internets and, and Google this and, and look at pictures of Vaticanus. Just up, upon appearance, you'll see it's worthless. <clears throat> you know, if, it's, if Vaticanus ain't even good enough for the Catholics, it's got to be pretty worthless. I believe without a shadow of the doubt with I believe without a shadow of a doubt that the received text is the God of War. My mouth my mouth's dry. I believe without a shadow of a doubt that the received text is the pure word of God. I gotta wet this gizzard. <clears throat> the difference between us fundamentalists and other groups out there is that we fundamentalists, we believe that we have God's pure word right here in our hands, infallible, inerrant, perfect. You'd be surprised at how many other Christian groups out there, they don't believe that they have God's perfect word. I believe that there's an unbroken line of God's word that for me as an English speaker, it's, it's right here in the King James Bible, and you can draw a an uninterrupted beeline all the way back to the Bible authors themselves. This line I speak of is first produced by the Holy Spirit working through men wherever they were, and it was organized into a Bible in Antioch not long after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then this word, it was dispersed all over the known world at that time, and, and over the centuries dispersed even more. We have physical evidence of this, the true word of God in the Syriac Peshitta that was produced in the year 150 AD. That's centuries before the fourth century AD. That's centuries before Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus were supposedly produced. This line, it continues through the many traditional text-based translations that I mentioned in my last class and we have today in our beloved King James Bible that we trust our lives with. I believe that modern Bible versions, as well as the manuscripts they are translated from, are satanic attacks on God's word. You know, it was only, it was only in the late 19th, going into the 20th century, that intellectual pride and scholarly elitism informed us that we cannot trust this King James Bible that we've had for centuries. And it ain't no coincidence that when this law was accepted by the masses, that Christianity began to disintegrate. Just, just look at Christianity nowadays. I, I think uh, the modern Bibles have a lot to do with that. You know, despite the claim of some textual scholars, the, the critical text, it's really shady, and you just can't get around the substantial evidence that they are shady. I've often wondered why, why some highly esteemed scholars would continue to teach that the authenticity and reliability of these critical text manuscripts, but to me, the answer is pretty simple when you think about it. Imagine what it would do to the reputation of a scholar if they reversed their position on this. Imagine if these puffed up scholars changed their position and came out and they said that the credibility and authenticity of the critical text is questionable. It would damage their credibility. It's, they're not gonna do it. But the simple solution to this textual problem is just grab you a King James Bible. It's translated from the true text, and I'll, I'll talk about the received text deeper in a later class. But, you know, this King James Bible, it's, it's changed more lives and saved more souls than any other book in English history. That's for sure. And it's presided over widespread um, revivals that, that had a greatness that we, we don't even understand in this day of age. And also, you know, here in America, there's no copyright on the King James Bible. 
there's a copyright on virtually every modern version out there. Uh, I, I don't think that Zondervan or Thomas Nelson or any of these other Bible publishers have a copyright on God's Word. But, uh, yeah, that's about all I have on this class. I don't know where I'll, exactly where I'll go in this class, but I hope you all found this interesting and, and that this little chart right here helps you understand it. And I'll see you all later at service. <laughs>